Good evening. It's time for us to begin our Sunday evening worship. So glad that you, you all can be back this evening to worship again our Lord and Savior. I have just a few announcements uh, that I will repeat from this morning, mostly from this morning. To continue to remember Troy Nations uh, as he continues to rehab. Uh, he's currently at Select Specialist Hospital where he's rehabbing there. So let's continue to remember Troy. Uh, Clay Wagner, uh, let's continue to remember them as well uh, in our prayer. Uh, Clay is dealing with uh, colitis that he's dealing with. Please keep James and Betty Ann uh, Clay Wagner in your prayers for the colitis that he's dealing with. Please keep uh, Marion and Jessica Overby in your prayers. Uh, they have COVID. Uh, this is the daughter and son-in-law, Jim and Joyce Green. Uh, they're four and six-year-old. Uh, have tested negative, uh, but uh, continues to be in quarantine. Please keep Ryan and, and Mandy in English in your prayer. Uh, both had COVID. Mandy is uh, the granddaughter of Hewlett and Annette Parrott. Uh, the two children have COVID as well, so no, it's pretty tough when the entire family had it. I, I can almost relate to that because we almost had the same thing ourselves. Uh, let's continue to remember Brother Bob in our prayer. Brother Bob, brother passed this morning, uh, his younger brother, so let's continue to remember him and, the, and his loss at this time. But we do have some really good news that we can can announce today. Amber Carraway, uh, she was here this morning. It's Amber, raise your hand. That's Amber. Uh, let's, let's, Amber was baptized this, this afternoon by Derek. Uh, Derek and Hannah were studying with us this morning as well, so we we like to congratulate her on her decisions to take Christ on in baptism. So that's a wonderful lesson. So let's make sure we welcome her. Men's Fellowship, September the 13th at 6.30. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the, in the foyer. Uh, there are a few needs that we need from the standpoint if, you, if you're able to attend. Uh, crackers, Fritos, shredded cheese, drinks, uh, and desserts. Ladies' Day, um, the door knocking, I was told, went well this past weekend. Uh, September the 18th at 9 a.m., uh, all ladies are, are invited to attend. But for, before we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, we're so thankful, Father, that you have continued to bless our lives, Father, that you allowed us to return here, Father, to hear another portion of your blessing. Uh, Father, we pray that we continue to... Hear these things, Father, and as we apply them to our everyday life, Father, as we share them with others, Father. Father, we're so thankful for Amber's decision, Father, to take you on in baptism, Father. We pray that uh, we will also rejoice with our Father, and Father, that she will lean on us for things that she needs, Father, and we can lean on her, for Father, for the things that we need, Father, as well, Father. Father, we continue to remember those victims who are still struggling with the, at the hurricane, Father. Father, we pray that the things that they stand in need of, Father, that they continue to get those things, Father, that would make their lives much easier in the, in the upcoming days, Father. Father, we continue to pray for our country as it continues to be riven with the COVID, Father. We pray that you would bless us, doctors and nurses that attend to so many people that have come down with the COVID, Father. Father, we pray that we continue to look to you, Father, for guidance. And our, we pray that our leaders of our country, Father, would do the well as well, Father that they will look to you for the things that's best suited for your people, Father. Father, as we continue to travel through this life, Father, as, as pilgrims through it, Father, we pray that we continue to look to you, Father, for that guidance and the things that are needed for our lives, for we can continue to live, be that example for those about us, Father. Father, we continue to pray for the ones who are suffering through sickness. Father, we pray that if it's your will, that you restore them back to their most holy, holy health and strength, Father. Father, we can pray Pray for the ones who have lost loved ones, Father, especially Brother Bob at this time, Father, and the loss of his brother. Father, we pray you that you give him strength, Father, his family, uh, and the loss of John, Father. We pray that you would give them understanding of these things, Father. Father, we thank you for your love for your son, that you sent him, Father, that he shed his life upon Calvary's cross, Father, for each and every one of us, Father. Forgive us when we fall short of your will, and as we return and repent of those things, Father. It's your name we do humbly pray. Amen. Opening song is five five nine five five nine. We'll sing verses one, two, and four. One, two, and four. <clears throat> 
There is a habitation built by the living God for all every nation to seek that grand abode. O Zion, Zion, I long against to see O Zion, Zion, when
Father God, thank you so much for another first day of the week that you've given us an opportunity and the chance to come and worship your son. We thank you for that. Lord, specifically, we come to you now asking that you will give Derek the ability to uh, preach what he has studied this week and that we will take it in, that we will listen with the ten of ears and that we will be able to apply it to our lives, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that each one of us will be able to grow closer to you each and every day by the worshiping that we do, by the reading of your word, by the fellowshipping with other Christians, and by using our gifts and talents to glorify your name and to teach others your word. Father, specifically this evening, we come to you in prayer. We have a lot of people on the sick list. Specifically, we want to continue to remember Troy Nations and pray for his uh, healing against against um, his sickness, Lord. Lord, we also uh, more broadly want to pray for uh, Ryan and Mandy English and all, all the people here and all the people across this state and all the people across this country, all the people across the world, Lord, that are dealing with this disease. Lord, it has affected us. It's affected everyone on this whole entire earth in, in various and different ways. So, Lord, we just pray that somehow that you will grant us the grace and the mercy to get past this pandemic. And as a result of it, somehow help us to each grow closer to one another in Christ as a family. Father, uh, I just pray that you'll go with us through this service. Help us to draw near to you. Please forgive us as we repent of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. If you are using a book and want to mark the song of encouragement after the lesson, it will be 667, 667. Before the lesson, we'll sing 234, 234. If you will, please stand. We'll sing all three verses. Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to Him I sing, onward I go. to welcome you all here. We, uh, I'm trying to look and see. That's how we don't have a lot of visitors in the, in the audience with us tonight, but if you are here visiting with, you, with us, we are glad you're here. You know, it's great to be with God's family. Uh, it's great to be able to come together and to worship. Um, it was great to, this morning to be together in Bible class. 
uh, and study God's word. And I would say this, if you're not attending Bible classes, that's Sundays, that's Wednesdays, that's any other time you have the opportunity. Uh, We're having our men's fellowship tomorrow night. We're going to have some Bible study there. I I hope you come and be a part of that. Uh, The the women of the word, it went went so well the first time that they said, how about we go twice a month now? And so now the women of the word, they're going twice a month now. Uh, And so that's going to be great. Uh, That's going to be the first and third uh, Monday nights of the month. And so there's all kinds of ways to study God's Word, and so please take advantage of those. And I mentioned this to you because tonight we're talking about living for God. And I used to think that I was living for God. And when I, when I say that, I mean that I used, to, I used to think I was on fire for God, and that I love God with all of my being, with, and that, that's just what I thought. But then I remember going on my first mission trip, and I remember the first few houses we went to, I realized, wow, I need to do some more studying. The first few questions that I got asked, I said, you know what? I need to, I need to freshen up on some things. And I remember coming home from that first mission trip and, and recognizing that, you know, my life's, my life's pretty good. You know, we do here in the United States, we have a lot of things we take for granted. Um, you know, we went three weeks back earlier part of the year without water, and I thought it was the end of the world. Three weeks. Okay? Now, three weeks is not pleasant. And it wasn't pleasant for my family because I, after three weeks of not showering, it didn't smell too good um, in there. But uh, let me just tell you, three weeks without water, it wasn't the worst. It's been, it's been worse, and right now there's people uh, south of us down in New Orleans area, uh, Louisiana, and uh, southern Mississippi and all places that they're still trying to recover, and they're going to be still trying to recover for a very long time. So I get back to these trips, and I realize, you know what? I do have it pretty good. And that made, makes you recognize, you know, was I really on fire for God before I went on, uh, on that trip? Well, maybe not as much as I should have. And it doesn't take a mission trip. It doesn't take an effort like that to set you on fire again. A lot of our young people, they love going to Sardis Lake Christian Camp. Sardis Lake Christian Camp has been one of the greatest tools uh, that the churches have used to help uh, evangelize to our kids uh, and has kept them faithful to the Lord's Church for generations now, okay? But uh, let me tell you, those kids, when they come back from camp, if you, you want to have a spiritual moment where you can, that they're going to be on fire, I guarantee you the week after camp, they're on fire. And you can, you can preach a lesson, and you're going to have a lot of responses, and they're going to love you for it, and they're going to love the lesson because they're on fire for God because they've been spending a week together with fellow Christians, and they've been sweaty, and they've been hot, and they've been tired. But guess what? They've had God on their side, and it just motivates them on through it. Drew can attest to this. Years. Drew, you spent, what, two years at Free Hardman? Is that right? Two years. I spent two years at Free Hardman as well couple years at a Christian college, Morgan knows this as well. I tell you, day in and day out, we felt with fellow Christians, that'll motivate you. Come back to the dorm midnight, and you see a group of your friends sitting over here in the corner just praying together. See another group of friends that they just start singing. Now, that'll get you on fire for God. When I look into the New Testament, especially in Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. It's one of my favorite places to read because I look and I see the church in their very beginning and they were on fire for God and they loved God and they were together and they had all things in common and the people even around them respected them for it and they noticed something different about this group of people. A couple months ago, we had Brother Rob Whitaker come, came and he talked to us about, about evangelism. I said, I used to think I was on fire for God. And then he started speaking. And I realized, you know what? Maybe my fire has dwindled. Maybe my fire has gone out. Maybe my fire was not the way it needed to be. Maybe I wasn't really living for God the way I needed to live. Because the reality is, is there are billions of lost souls in this world. And they need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tonight we're going to talk about living for God. We're going to put a lot of emphasis on living. Because in the passage we're going to look look tonight, in 1 Peter chapter chapter 1, we're going to see 
some different things that are alive, that are living, that are active, that we need to make sure that are there alive and living and active in our lives. So the first thing we're going to see in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 13, we're going to see the beginning of some living instructions. Living instructions. And notice this, that these instructions are, are going to be something that's going to take action, it's going to take preparation, and it's going to take, take some effort on our part and on, on the part of the Christians that they're being written to here. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't normally use the term, the, the, the term gird up your loins. Okay, we don't use that term. We don't say gird up your loins. Uh, we might say, you know, go put a belt on. Uh, we might say, you know, for, for ladies that are, that are walking, that, that are walking across the wa- uh, puddle of water, they might have to kind of grab their skirt and kind of just pick it up a little bit so they can step over. But here is the imagery here. Here is a, here's a person that they're gathering up their outer garments uh, so they can get ready for either work, they can get ready for war, they can get ready for battle, they can get ready for whatever it is that they're going to be doing. And so they gird up their loins, they gird it up, they strap it down with a belt, and they're ready to go to work. They're ready to fight. They're ready to put in an effort. But notice this, it says, gird up the loins of your mind. See, here's a preparation we're talking about of girding up the loins of maybe a garment, but this isn't a garment here. This is gird up the loins of your mind. That here in this effort, we're going to make sure that our mind is prepared, that our mind is active, that our mind is alive, and it's ready to go to work. Because being a Christian, it's about living as a Christian. How many of us, and I myself included, have sat in these pews when Brother Gary, go back a decade or so, when Mark Ray or whoever was preaching a sermon up here, how many of us have sat in these pews and our mind was not ready for worship that day? That our mind was not prepared for what we were doing? That our mind was elsewhere? And then when someone catches us and, and says something about the sermon and says, well, how good of a sermon that was that, that we really have a hard time giving an answer. I'll say, I've been there and I've done that. I've been distracted before, as we probably we all have. Gird up the loins of your mind. We're getting our mind prepared. We're getting our mind ready. We're getting our mind active and alive so that we can go to work and so that we can do what we're being called to do. So we're putting this preparation into it, but it's not just into our mind. It's into our whole demeanor, into our whole nature. It says, for, it continues on in this verse, it says, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to look at a few verses tonight talking about this particular verse. Let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Notice this as we look at this verse, that we are going to present ourselves. He said, he's begging when he's pleading, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, which means we got to get ready. We have to be prepared. Our bodies have to be ready to be presented. And then we're going to come and see, it says, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. But then it talks about our mind. Do not be conformed to this world. We're not supposed to be like everybody else. We're not supposed to adapt to what they're doing. We're supposed to be as God called us to be. That is part of us girding up our minds. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, the renewal of your mind will help us to understand what it truly means to be sober, what it truly means to be sober before God. We look at this idea in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse 15, still talking about this idea of readiness, talking about getting our mind ready. 1 Peter 3, 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you 
with meekness and fear. So we're girding up the, the loins of, of our mind. We're getting ready. We're staying ready, as we see here at 1 Peter 3.15. We're keeping ourselves ready for God. But what about this soberness? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are, let us who are the sober uh, of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation." What does this tell us about soberness? What does it tell us that soberness means? Soberness means that we're awake. Soberness means that we're thinking right, that we have our, have our mind about us. Soberness means that we're not intoxicated. Soberness means that we're not letting anything control us. Soberness means that we are grounded. All these terms can go in to help us define what soberness really means for us, that we're to gird up our minds, we are to be sober. We're to be awake. We're to be alive. We're to be conscious of what is going on around us with open eyes, paying attention for the Lord and for the purpose of spreading his gospel. But what about this hope? It says, rest your hope fully upon the grace that he brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When I think about hope, I think about Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Because here in this discussion of faith, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You, you can also look into this and you see that faith is the, is the assurance, is the conviction, is these words, you can read those in the, in the American Standard Version, it uses words like assurance, it uses words like conviction, when we have that assurance, we have that conviction, we have that evidence, we have that substance, you know what we have? We have that hope. Because now we are believing, truly, wholeheartedly believing in God. We're believing that he came, we're believing that he's coming back. We're believing both. We're believing that Jesus Christ came and lived and died as the word of God says. We believe that he's coming back as the word of God says. That gives us great hope. But if we're going to be ready, we're going to have our minds girded up, we're going to be sober, and we've got to make sure that we're saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, for, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself is the gift of, gift of God. So we're saved by grace, but it's through faith, through that faithful obedience to him. And that's not a one-time faithful obedience. That's a continual faithful obedience that we are to be living for God. And if we do so, then when he comes back, we will be ready. We'll remain sober. We'll, we'll be able to, to glory in that hope because that hope will now be there in front of us, standing, staring us face to face. Because Jesus is our hope. John 14, verses 1 and 3, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. These are just a few living instructions we see here in verse 13 for us to gird up the ones of our mind, to be sober to rest our hope, to rest our hope on Jesus. But what other instructions do we see here within this text? Let's move on to verse 14, and we're going to start a section that I like to entitle a living standard. You see, not only are the instructions living and live and active and something that we need to partake, be partaking in, the standard that is set before us is alive. It's living. It's something that we need to understand that if we're going to be pleasing before God, we have to be alive and we have to be living for him. Notice this in verse 14 as we turn there together. It says, as obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lust as in your ignorance. Obedient children. You know, my children are still pretty young. And for the most part, they're pretty obedient. But like any child... They misbehave sometimes, and they disobey, 
And it's frustrating as a parent when your child will not obey, has a bad day, just is not, not listening to what you have to say. Now, what does a child need when a child's not being obedient? They need discipline. They need instruction. They need correction. They need to be brought back in. And then they need brought back in to know this is what's right. This is what's wrong. And I love you. It's a little bit of combination of all of it. The standard that is set before us is to be obedient children, which means that we are serving our Father, that we are serving our Lord, that we are looking to the Word and seeing what our Father has told us to do, and therefore we are to do it. Just like Jesus was supposed to be about his father's business when he was 12 years old, we are to continually be about the father's business day in and day out. We are to be obedient children. As an obedient child, we put ourselves into submission, into submission under the father, under our Lord. Some problems that our world has right now is a lot of people do not want to be obedient children. They do not want to be submissive to anybody. And the lack of respect we see in our world from day in and day out, it causes a lot of problems. We as Christians are to rise above that and to live to a different standard. In fact, in verses 15 and 16, we're going to see a word that describes our standard, describes the standard that's set before us. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. See, our standard is not based on the standard of this world. Our standard is not based off the standard of, you know, some test somewhere, some books somewhere that's written by men. Our standard is based on the standard of our God and what he has told us he wants us to be. And the word that he uses here to describe that standard is holy. That here we are, that we're going to be set apart, that we're going to be for God, that we're going to be special, that we're going to be this this glorious people in him because he has made us special. And he has given us glory. We are to be this purified, justified people before him that are actively living for him day in and day out. We are to be holy as he is holy. So we're to be obedient. We're to be holy. Verse 17, and if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Notice the standard that's set here before us as we see is we are to be working, we're to be workers. This is work to, according to each one's work, and then it says conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay. That's a continuation. That if we want to truly reach the standard of living for Christ, then we have to be obedient, we have to be holy, we have to be working. And if we're not obedient and holy and working, then we're not living up to the standard that God has set for us. And I would say this, then we're not truly living for God. But we all know, we all know that God is the only way. That Jesus is the only way. That's the only way we can reach salvation. That's the only way that we can reach heaven. That he is truly the way. So I know for a fact that we here tonight, that those even here this morning, that those that are listening online, that we want to live for God. But that might mean that today I have to check some things in my life, that I have to correct some things to make sure that I am truly living for him. One of my favorite verses here in 1 John chapter 1 is verse 7. But walk, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, I don't know about you, but I don't actually like darkness. I don't tell a lot of people that. We we keep the TV on in the living room um, at night just to put a little light in the house. I don't like it pitch dark. Now, that has to do with just a little bit of security. 
a little bit of safety, a little bit of comfort. What about her spiritually? Spiritually speaking, do we like a little bit of darkness? Do we like a lot of darkness? Do we love the light? We, we like to talk like we all love the light. Do our light, lives show that we truly love the light? Do our lives show that we truly hate the darkness? Or do our lives show that we're somewhere in between? That we like a little darkness? That we like a little sin? After all, sin's fun. But we're not to be people of the night. We're not to be people of the darkness. We're not to be people of the world. We're to be different. We're to live by a different standard. And in fact, we're to walk in that standard. But if we walk in the light, it's a continual walk, as he is in the light, that's where I want to be. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we're truly living for God, then we're truly coming and making sure we are cleansed of our sin, and we're in a right relationship with him. The last one tonight, as we're talking about living for God, I want us to talk about living, our, the, our living faith and hope. Our living faith and our living hope. To do this, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, from the dead. Why is our hope living? I'll give you one reason. Our hope's living because Jesus is alive. Our hope is living because Jesus is living. Our hope is living because Jesus rose on the third day, and now we too have an opportunity to rise in newness of life, just in his likeness. Our hope is is alive and is sure and is present and is not going anywhere. There is no, nothing on this earth, there is no person on this earth, there is no power on this earth that can take away our hope because our hope is alive. Now some of us, we talk about that hope, we forget about our Part about that faithful lifestyle, about that faithful living. We just talked about our standard moments ago when we read verse 17. Let's read it again. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. You see, when we talk about our work as Christians, we're going to tie that into our faith. Our faith and our work are going to be tied together. And we're going to see that here in a few moments when we, when we go uh, to the book of James. But I want us to see here that in our work, this is not just any work. This is our godly work. This is our, our service work as we serve him before God. This is our obedience and faith before him. One word to help describe it, this is our faithful, our faithful living. So how are we faithfully living before him? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold through your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as the lamb without blemish and without spot. When we were faithfully obedient to God, we were cleansed by something that was more precious than anything this world has to offer. We were cleansed by the precious blood of Christ. He was that perfect lamb, that lamb without blemish and without spot. That lamb, that sacrifice, that blood has made us a very special people. And as his special people, we are to have a living faith, a living hope, because our faith and our hope are in Christ Jesus. Verse, verses 
21, who through him believe in God, who raised from the dead and gave him glory. So your faith and your hope are in God. Tonight, is your faith, is your hope in God? And when I say is your faith in God, is your trust in God? Is your work in God? Today, as we worship, was your worship in God? Was it by his authority? Was it in the manner in which he told us to do? Are we living a way in the which he told us to live? Because there's only one faith. There's only one way. And that's supposed to be the living way. The way that leads to eternal life. What about your hope? Is your hope secure? Is it sure? Is it perfect? Are you convicted? Do you know that you're saved? Because we can know that we're saved. And if we will know that we're saved, then we can know that we're living. And if we know that we're living, then we know that we're working. If we know that we're working, we know that we're doing what the Lord has told us to do. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. What does it profit, my brethren? If someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked or destitute of daily food, and one of you, say, uh, you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? There's also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. That's showing them a living faith. A faith that believes, a faith that trusts, a faith that obeys, a faith that endures through it all to the very end. Shows them a hope, a hope that's alive, a hope that's secure, and a hope that will, that will one day be seen face to face as Jesus Christ returns. Tonight, are we living for God? Are we following his living stru instructions? Are we living by that living standard? Do we have a living and working faith? Do we know who is our living hope? Are we living for God? Tonight, if there's anything we can do for you, whether prayers to the church or tonight you want to put on Christ in baptism, please do not wait any moment. We would love to assist you uh, with those things. Please come as we stand and as we sing. Care Group 2 this evening after the service will meet in B1.
Our closing song will be back in our folders. It will be B78. B78, we'll sing verses 1 and 3 of that. If there's anyone here tonight who is not able to partake of the Lord's Supper, you may exit at this time and you will be served in room B1. B78, verses 1 and 3. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us come out here and study another portion of your word and sing praises and lift up prayers to you, Lord. We're thankful for all the ones that have prepared lessons this morning, this afternoon, and shared it with us, Lord, and with all your people around the world, Lord. And we ask you to be with the elders all over um, the world, Lord, that shepherd your church and ask them to always look to you for guidance and making their decisions, Lord. Dear Lord, we ask you to be with us in this, this week, Lord, as we go to our schools and workplaces and help us to be the proper example you would have us to be, Lord. Dear Lord, we thankful for the ones that have got back safely from the youth events, Lord. We thank you for all the traveling we do, Lord, and getting to and from safely, Lord. Be with the ones that are trying to recover in the hospitals and at home, Lord, and help them to be get better, Lord, if it's your will, Lord. And we ask you to forgive us when we fail you, Lord, and as we forgive others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.